Hello, and thank you for joining us on Press Row. I'm Matt Finkel, joined as always by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, and Mark Kuntz there on the end. Guys, let's talk some MAC Midwest Athletic Conference baseball. The conference pretty strong top to bottom, and there's two unbeatens in league play, Coldwater and Versailles. And I know we've got a big week coming up with the schedule. You think this could be the week that decides who wins the conference? Well, you know, if you got the two undefeated playing, that should settle things pretty well, or at least give you a, a good schematic of where we're going uh, with Versailles and Coldwater playing each other. But still, it, it's it's somewhat uneven still because I, I think one team's got one more game than the other, if I recall. Coldwater so, has one more. Yeah, so it's still so if Versailles wins that, Coldwater still got a game in hand. And so it, it's a little less clear, but obviously the two big dogs are playing, so that's going to help clear things up. Well, and one of those games that Versailles needs to make up, the game Versailles does need to make up, is Fort Recovery. They're going to play next Monday. And certainly Coldwater getting that win at Fort Recovery Tuesday game, you can see on WOSN, was a huge win for the Cavaliers. Not only because they got that victory with Fort Recovery, but Kyle McKibben went the distance. They weren't they were able to save the rest of their pitchers, so Cavs will have that full complement of arms ready for Versailles down in Dark County on Thursday evening. Well, you still have, like we mentioned, Coldwater and Versailles. They play each other on Thursday afternoon, but you've got a team in Minster that's only got one loss in the league that's tied for third, and they're 14-3-1. and one. How they got a tie in hmm. baseball is beyond me. H have you paid attention to what's happened with the weather the last couple of <laughs> Yeah. Years? Yeah, and I, if, I think their tie might have been Salina. I think that was a game. If I remember right, yes. Early in the season, it was a cold. Uh, uh, you had snow and sleet running down. They went... 10 innings, I said, forget it. We're not going to play this anymore and call it right there. So you got Minster in the mix. And also, St. John's is a team that could bite some people. We, we talked about this before, yep. about how the last couple weeks of the season, with everything going on with the postseason and getting games thrown back in the condensed schedule, some fluky things could happen. And Ryan Hellman for St. John's is a pitcher that could, when he's on, he could beat anybody. So I, the Blue Jays could still factor into all this. And, and Parkway's not a team to sleep on either at this point. And you mentioned Fort Recovery as well. And also another team that could, you know, play some spoilers, St. Henry, another team out of the MAC, also going into the next couple of weeks of regular season play. Five MAC teams are ranked in the coaches' poll, the week two of the coaches' poll, and Delphi St. John's also receiving votes, so you can throw more than half the league is on everyone's radar. So it, MAC baseball has been impressive early on. Also impressive, as it usually is, WBL softball, but a different team at the top right now than we're used to seeing at least in the past decade, and that's Wapakoneta. They're unbeaten. Can anyone slow them down? It doesn't look like it. I mean, if you if you compare how things have gone to this point uh, with their scores and other teams in the league, it looks like uh, nobody's going to head them off. Uh, quite a story for them. They were both undefeated softball and baseball until earlier this week when Salina beat Wapak baseball. But yeah, Wapak softball is in the driver's seat right now. And truthfully, some of the other teams in the league that might have been able to threaten them uh, have taken a step back. Uh, Shawnee had. Alyssa Windau come down with a little bit of arm problem. They've taken a step back. Right now, it's Wapak's to lose in softball. Well, Wapak already beat Shawnee in softball. They, that was kind of their win a few weeks ago. It kind right. of cemented them as the, as the front runner. I think Friday pretty much is going to decide the Western Buckeye League softball race as Shawnee is set to play, or I'm sorry, uh, Wapakoneta is set to play Defiance. I, I think that's going to be the deciding factor in the WBL this year. Todd mentioned the Wapak-Shawnee game, but I want to go back to Wapak Bath and the, you know, the storied program that Bath still is. You know, you can't write them off by any stretch of the imagination, but to come out and just waylay on them like they did is uber impressive to me. And uh, I think it's Wapak's to lose, you know, barring any unforeseen coming up in the next few weeks. Well, yeah. that victory for Wapakonet over Bath left some Bath folks kind of scrambling to see if they could figure out the last time Bath softball has been run rolled. And I don't, I don't know if anybody's dug back deep enough to try and figure that out, but the fact that nobody can say that off the top of your head tells you your answer right there. Right. Well, yeah, the other thing about you mentioned Wapak had already beaten Shawnee, and now that they've taken a step back, that's one that can't hope for a tie you know, along the way. If you've already lost to them, you want to keep winning and get some help, but you couldn't even keep that part of the bargain up. So Wapak's in the driver's seat. It's a good place to be. And the Salina Lady Bulldogs were a team I was looking at that could potentially trip up Wapak, but the Lady Redskins, Bill Simons and company, took care of them on Tuesday. So. As, we, as we've said, Friday's game against Defiance figures to be the big one for WBL softball. All right, on to the NFL draft. Thursday is round one, Friday's round two and three, and then the weekend, we'll do it over four days. But we're, let's talk about round one. What do you think the Browns need to do with the eighth pick and then the Bengals with the 24th pick? Well, I'm certainly no draft, Nick, but I, I've been saying for a while, the Browns need playmakers. I, I'm not sold that RG3 is an MVP quarterback, but... 
at least you, you have a guy there. It appears they've settled on him since they traded the number two pick. So it, that tells you they're not taking a quarterback. I think in this league, the way things are now, you've got to have a playmaker receiver. The Doxon kid out of TCU, to me, makes a lot of sense. But at least in that area, they have to go that way to begin with. I think they got to. You mentioned Doxon, and he's been, you know, mocked to the Bengals at 24. Mm -hmm. You know, every mock I've seen has the Bengals at 24 going receiver, you know, which they can, they can you look at what they've cushion. lost the last yes. couple, you know, this past off season. Certainly, I think the, the receiver is where the Bengals are going to be looking for in that first pick. Also going to look for some defensive help, uh, defensive end help as Abs well. Absolutely. But let's go back to the Browns for a second. This is a team that need help, needs help pretty much at every position going into this draft, whether it be an offensive lineman to compliment Joe Thomas, provided he's still there, you know, that he could potentially be moved. There's talk that the Browns may trade down. You know, they could go defensive line. Whatever Joey they Bosa. do, don't trade down to the 22nd pick. Right. <laughs> They've had a say horrible that. history the last couple of years of picking bad quarterbacks in the 22nd pick. You know, Joey Bosa has been talked about at number eight. He's also been talked about in Tampa Bay at number nine if he gets that far. You know, Ezekiel Elliott is another person. The Browns have a decent running game. That's one of the probably the stronger points of this draft and this going into this weekend and then going into OTAs and stuff. I think they've got to get a playmaker on the defensive side of ball. If Jalen Ramsey is there, which he won't be, I would snatch him in a second. Miles Jack could be a possibility. I think the Browns will go defense with that pick at eight if they stay there. I would like to see the Browns just make a solid pick mm -hmm. at number eight. You don't need to make a splash pick. There's too many holes in this team to worry about finding the quote-unquote savior. Make some solid picks. Plenty of picks in the top 100 in this draft for the Browns. You can really build something off of this draft as long as you go with the solid picks and not the splash picks. Agree with you wholeheartedly. Well, I think the thing the Browns front office has to avoid is it doesn't matter who they pick, where they pick, if they trade down, if they don't trade down. Everybody's going to say, that's a great pick. But, yeah, the Browns took him. <laughs> He's going to so do they, something bad right. because he's a so Brown now. This draft class needs to make an impact this year on the field to sort of bring us past all that, to justify this front office's ability to change things. That's why this draft is so important. Whoever they take, these guys have to be on the field on Sundays making contributions toward an improving team. Forget all the reviews of it in the days after the draft because everybody will have that caveat. But if these guys come out and perform, it'll signal a new era for real in the front office, and that'll be very important. Well, a lot of the mock drafts that I've seen have had either Joey Bosa or Ezekiel Elliott going to the Browns at eight, keeping it in Ohio. And those are two of potentially seven Ohio State Buckeyes who could go in the first round. Eight if you want to throw in yeah. Noah Spence. So yeah, out of those Buckeye, eight then, yeah. and it looks like two in the top ten for sure, out of all of those players, who's going to have the best NFL career? Well, you, we're hearing a lot about perhaps Zeke Elliott going to the Cowboys in, in that, top, that top pick for Dallas. You know, Cowboys are certainly one of the teams, one of the franchises that still use a, a running back as we grew up used to seeing running backs getting used. So I, I think with Zeke, if he lands in Dallas, it could be a good spot for him. But let's face it, the NFL doesn't use the running backs like they used to. I think Taylor Decker could have the best NFL career out of all of these top Ohio State prospects because offensive line isn't so much dependent upon what system you could put in. If you're a good offensive lineman, you're a good offensive lineman. I think you look at some of the defenders Ohio State could see in the first round. I think you look at Zeke, you look at Boza. It depends on where they land. I think Decker, wherever he lands, I think is in the best position. You took my answer, and here's why I thought Taylor Decker as well. It's because he can be nasty for 60 minutes a week. Get him in the trenches, you know, especially if he goes to, say, a Washington or somebody in the NFC East where, you know, it gets hot and heavy, especially in the months of November and December. I think he fits the mold of a gritty offensive lineman who could fit in there. Detroit has been mentioned. Him and Jack Conklin seem they're going back and forth. The mocks are as to those two who goes to Detroit. I mean, you're looking at two guys that could go in and, you know, same type of mold, that grit, nasty type. I would say Taylor Decker as well. But I'm really, really interested to see where Vaughn Bell and Adolphus Washington ends up in the draft. Washington, more than likely going to be a Saturday pick. How does he play at the next level, coming off of a solid senior season, but missing a bowl game as well? How does he portray long term? Yeah, I, I think Bosa has the potential to make the most long term impact because 
uh, as some of you guys talked about with the Browns draft, get a playmaker on defense. Bosa's a guy that can do that. Uh, I, I like Ezekiel Elliott, too. I think he's going to be a great pro. But I think as far as the biggest upside as far as a career, I think Bosa could be the one that has the best career. It's unfortunate for Zeke that running backs are such a commodity now with the injury risk associated with them because he was such a standout player with the Buckeyes, but it says something that he is still being discussed as a top 10 pick, even knowing that running backs are not used like that anymore. Keep an eye on Chicago guys at 12. With in Stan regards. Drayton, former Ohio State running backs coach now with the, the Chicago Bears. He's had a long relationship with, the, with Ezekiel and the Elliott family. Yeah, absolutely. If, if Elliott is there at 12, it would not surprise me to see him end up in Chicago. All right, let's close with the NBA. The Cavs swept the Pistons, so now they've earned a week off. What are they, gonna, what do they need to do to avoid rust before round two? Remember, the finals aren't until the middle of June, the end of June. We're not even in May yet, taping this on Wednesday, April 26th or whatever, 27th. So It's an interesting question because I, I think the Cavaliers have been trying to rest themselves all season, mm -hmm. and now they're getting the gift of rest, but does it come at the expense of being sharp? Uh, I think the way you overcome that is to stick with the game plan, which is get others involved scoring the basketball, don't lean on LeBron for all your offense as far as the scoring, and focus on defense. If the defense is there, you can weather some early series stumbles offensively. I think that's what they need to focus on coming back against Atlanta or Boston. We talked about it last week. You know, it seems the Cavs are a better team when LeBron isn't carrying that, the mass of the scoring load, as we've seen with Kyrie Irving, as we saw with Kevin Love. You have another solid piece in J.R. Smith knocking down shots as well in that series against Detroit. But to phrase Allen Iverson, not a game, not a game, practice. Take a couple days off, but get back into the grind of practice and work on, as you said, on the defensive side of the ball. On the offensive side, they'll be fine. Well, what I like about where the Cavs are right now is we're hearing a lot about how this is the best chemistry they've had all season long and when you've got good chemistry you can sit a few days because yep. the lingering issues aren't there festering without playing so I, I like where Cleveland is right now and the, and the fact that they're going to have a couple of days off I think will help them down the road because whoever they get whether it's Atlanta or Boston they're going to have to go through at least a six game series so they're going to be a little bit more beat up and you know the fact that we're seeing a finally a healthy Kyrie Irving I think that's been lost a little bit this season yeah. that, that mm -hmm. Kyrie wasn't hundred percent for the first half of the year that it took him a little while to, to get back into play shape to get back and to trust his body and we're seeing what we saw a few years ago out of Kyrie Irving the other thing too guys is regardless of what happens with Boston and Atlanta that second round series doesn't start till Monday so theoretically you still got five full days to rest and be ready to roll for game one so there's I mean Eight days in the NBA is an eternity off. Yeah, I think Mark's point about the chemistry is, is a good one, but I, don't, I think it's a tenuous chemistry. This bunch doesn't strike me as really fitting all that well together, but as long as they're winning, the chemistry will be fine. They swept the Pistons, so everything's hunky-dory. We'll see how it holds up when there's real adversity in a series, mm -hmm. which I don't think is going to happen in the next round either. But right now, everything's great. Well, you were talking about health. On the Western Conference, nobody's healthy, and yeah. the way it's shaping Which up... Which just means the Spurs are just going to find their right. way into the finals once again Possibly. and win another title. But for Cleveland, isn't it becoming more and more likely that they have... This is their best chance. We always thought this was their window, and with the injuries to the Warriors and the Clippers and you know the Spurs being old, if it doesn't happen this year, when is it going to happen? Yeah, well, and again, you're talking about LeBron's window closing, too, even though he's in incredible shape. But... Yeah, I think really that remains to be seen. The Warriors probably can get by another series without Steph Curry, but how long does that linger? How does it affect him when he comes back? Does he not get in the flow right away? And does this open it up for the Spurs? And are the Spurs really a better matchup in the first place? I guess that's a question we'll find out. You know, what impressed me about Golden State was, you know, Curry gets hurt at the, at the end of the first half. They're in, they go into the locker room tied at 56. And they come out, and they win by 34. Yeah, yeah but the they're playing half. the Rockets. I know. Granted, but it is the Rockets. You look are... at the regular season, though, when Curry had his, was, was off either because of he, he was sitting on, on – when, when Curry wasn't on the floor, Golden State was still out playing everybody. Yes. Right. So, he, yes, Steph Curry is a, is a major part of the success for the Golden State Warriors, but they're not exactly missing 
without him. They're still a very, very good yeah. basketball team right. without him. They're a great team, and he makes them an exceptional, exceptional record-setting team. And you want to have him in your playoff run, but I mean, if you don't, the Warriors are still going to be a team to contend with. Great job, guys. That does it for this week's Press Row. Thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy your weekend activities, and we'll see you next week.